Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of The Surge. Uh, it's been about a week, I apologize. Uh, we've been a little bit busy with uh, COVID and whatnot and all these things going on, as you've been hearing around the world. So uh, for today, I'd like to talk about uh, vasoactive drugs and vasopressors, uh, mostly because it came up at work. Uh, certain concepts uh, and uh, opinions, controversies uh, were discussed. And um, it just, it really brought about a, a couple of things for me. Uh, one of them was the fact that, you know, as a quick disclaimer, I'm not sure that this is something that we teach very well in general, whether it's in medicine or in ICU or in the eMERGE or anesthesia or postgrad or undergrad. It's not something that, that we're very comfortable teaching or we're very comfortable teaching very well. Um, I would thoroughly suggest that everybody goes to derangephysiology.com, uh, spend 15 minutes reading up on things over there. A lot of what I'm going to talk about and the diagrams that I'm using are all from there, so uh, much respect uh, to the people who run that site. It got me through most of my residency. Um, you know, and I think their approach is, is far more uh, efficient than anything that, that I, I'm personally teaching at undergraduate level or at postgraduate level, and the reason why is because their approach has been to um, deregulate the setup. So we try and set things up so that we talk about vasopressors. So we either give a talk on sepsis and then talk about vasopressors, talk on um, cardiovascular conditions and talk about vasopressors and ionotropes. And I, I really do think that that's one reason why I have issues with it. The other reason is because institutional policy has dictated dogma. And we've had movements in the field of, of, of translational medicine as opposed to uh, evidence-based parameters when it comes to the use of vasoactive drugs in general. And so today I figured we would just have a, a quick rundown of what my personal take on this whole situation is. So right off the bat, I think that everybody agrees at white belt level, um, you're an R1 or, or an intern, uh, you're a first-year resident, it's your first week or month in the emergency room, ICU, or internal medicine ward, and you're first exposed to these things, and you know, you're told to start levofed, which is norepinephrine, or to start dobu if you're in certain centers in the states, which is dobu to me, and you know, you're not told why you're doing it, but you're told that it's a good thing to do it, especially if the guy's not arresting. If he's just hypotensive, just start the norepi, put in a central line, and you'll be fine. But one has to ask why. And there is some mythology here. In general, we've had some clinical practice guidelines come out over the years, every five to ten years. There's a consensus statement out there uh, from some society uh, or some working group. And these guidelines oftentimes offer evidence that has some bias to it. And that's because these patients are very complicated. So I see you confidence intervals cannot be as clear-cut as medicine or surgery. It's not as simple as a single organ problem that you would normally see in surgery, and it's not physiologically healthy patients. These are patients that are very complicated. And much like trauma, to, to reach a point where you are producing uh, an acceptably, or not acceptably, but a, a, a comparable amount of, of, of consensus in ICU data that you would in, say, uh, cardiac data, it is almost an impossibility. And, and, and that's because they're complicated patients. That's why they're in the ICU. But in general, what seems to be people's take on things is that um, the reason why we like dobutamine is because uh, it has mainly an effect on uh, improving the patient's overall state, hits multiple receptors at the same time, and produces some extra cardiac push. The reason why we like dopamine is because of the fact that uh, it uh, produces excellent outcomes in terms of the actual cardiac effect, the cardiac contractility effect. Uh, the reason why we like epinephrine is because we like epinephrine, to be honest. That's the only reason why we like it. It's because it's relatively cheap, and it, it, it does produce a very quick rapid onset result. Norepinephrine is usually hated. It's hated for multiple reasons. At least it was back in the 90s. Uh, the running joke was uh, levofed would leave them dead. One of the reasons why was because back in the day, I still remember being taught it this way, it's considered a dirty drug because it hits multiple receptors. 
and because it was relatively expensive at the time, I think, and because of the fact that uh, there was some thought process. And these were the Swan Gans uh, gang. These were the types of people like me. I still use Swan Gans catheters sometimes. That 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 very strongly believe in, in a uh, titered individual presser uh, selection problem solving response. And as we now know, in all types of shock, multiple things are happening at the same time. There's a distributive component and there's another component. That's why levofed uh, is probably a good drug that had a bad name at some point. And that's why many of the guidelines now really, really, really like norepinephrine. Uh, vasopressin is just great. Its main problem is that it will cause a reflexive bradycardia that we'll talk about and a couple of other issues here and there. But in general, it's great. Angiotensin 2, we're not going to talk about. Esmolol and Levosamandan, hell no. We're not going there. But the reason why people hated Levofed, just to not babble and dwell on the point, is because of the fact that it was considered a dirty drug where you didn't have to think you just gave it and hit all the receptors. The reason why people liked dobutamine was because it did the same thing but it was more well understood by the people who were giving it and had slightly more literature the reason why we don't like dobutamine outside of certain centers in the u.s that are mainly cardiac heavy or mainly hemorrhagic shock heavy is because we found that dobutamine produces worse outcomes as do other vasopressors and ionotropes when compared to levofed or norepinephrine and uh, I'm using trade name and generic interchangeably here because some people don't know the trade name, some people don't know the generic name. It's really badly understood at white blood level. And I'm using vasopressor and ionotrope interchangeably because I don't think that the distinction is as clear as people think it is. Um, when you look at the bigger scheme of things, norepinephrine has been very well studied at this point. It produces better outcomes with less arrhythmia risks. And that's the truth. It's also a little bit more pH and uh, glycemia tolerant. Some of these are very fragile. So uh, there are certain things like epinephrine will stop working at a pH of 6.9 or 7. Right? Nor epi still gives you a bit of a kick peripherally to keep you going. Now, the, the other thing is that people often associate vasopressors with death, and that's wrong. Just because you ha are on vasopressors as a binary point, it doesn't mean that you're going to survive or die. Vasopressors are just a bridge. This is very important to understand at white blood level. Your vasopressors are not the treatment. Your vasopressors are just a bridge towards the treatment. And so associating them with a poor prognosis is somewhat valid as an association. But they aren't a cause of a poor prognosis. They're just showing you that this patient is sicker than you think. right? And, you know, when people talk to me about dosing norepinephrine or noradrenaline, uh, I laugh because it doesn't make sense to me. There is no maximal dose. The reason why there's no maximal dose is twofold. The first is it depends on your receptor concentration. Uh, the second is because it depends on how, uh, how reactive your catecholamine receptors are. And as you can see, there's an extremely wide, wide therapeutic index. I don't believe in a, I personally do not believe in a maximum when it comes to these things. And if I were to compare dobutamine to norepinephrine, and I use them interchangeably in, in our ICU, depending on whether I need more of a cardiac effect or more of a uh, sort of general control of the hemodynamics effect. In general, you know, uh, norepinephrine has less of a cardiac effect. Dobutamine has more of a cardiac effect. Norepinephrine is less arrhythmogenic. Dobutamine is more arrhythmogenic in general. And we've already gone through this. Um, most of the literature supports norepinephrine as first-line therapy in most types of shock, except for cardiogenic. But my problem is that you won't know it's cardiogenic until you have something definitive there. And that's, that's my issue. Dobutamine also has another disadvantage, in my opinion. It's that as your heart rate goes up, your ability to have a consistent cardiac index goes down. And your systemic uh, vascular resistance goes down. And ultimately, you're not getting enough bang for your buck, in my opinion, once you're above a certain point. I think, you know, it's one of the very few vasopressors and ionotropes that I would say you might have a theoretical maximum. I think that there's a lot of mythology here. Myth number one is that you can be stable on levofed. 
you cannot be stable on norepinephrine. You can only use norepinephrine as a bridge towards something else. So if it's septic shock, you're using norepinephrine to gain control of the septic shock by draining the abscess, or by giving the antibiotics, or by changing the central line, or by treating the VAP, or et cetera, et cetera. If it's a, an unknown state of shock, you're using the norepinephrine to have enough time to investigate it further by doing an echo and an ultrasound and seeing what the patient's cardiac index is and seeing whether or not their ECG changes and whether or not you need to go to the cath. Uh, if uh, it's a hemorrhagic shock in particular, it's one of the very few types of shock where uh, norepinephrine is associated with worse outcomes because it gives you a sense of security. It makes you less likely to give blood. And so therefore, always think of levofed as a danger zone, right? You want to be off of the levofed as fast as you can. One of the main reasons why you're on levofed is probably because your patient may not have their fluid status optimized. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you should optimize patient's fluid st status and confirm it as you are going on to a vasopressor. Number two is the maximum dose. There is no maximum dose of any known vasoactive agent at this moment in time. It just doesn't exist. Different institutions do have different limits that they set. Different pharmacists will set different limits based on pharmacodynamics. But in general, in general, there is a theoretical maximum only when every single receptor has been occupied and is fully active and has been maximized. That is your theoretical maximum dose. So there is no maximum dose. And rather than dwell on the maximum dose, you should dwell on the target. So I see this a lot in ICUs all around the world, that we use different targets. Apart from certain pathologies like brain injuries, where you want to target a slightly higher map in certain situations, in general, in general, a map of 60 to 65 is thought to give you the minimum amount of vasopressor requirements with enough organ perfusion to maximize your autoregulation. And uh, the last misconception that I keep hearing from junior residents is that I want to diarrhea the patient, so uh, I gave him some, and they'll never say the, the, the generic name. It will never be the generic name. They'll never be that safe. These types of residents will never be that safe. They'll say something like, I gave him Lasix, and uh, I gave him Levofed to dry out the lungs to get him to be extubated tomorrow. That's, that's just wrong. When people say these things, it, it's very, very bad. It makes me very annoyed, uh, as some of you have heard before. So um, it's it's a problem for me that people associate fluid status with healthy and unhealthy lungs. Yes, that is. They are uh, indirectly linked in a way in many pathologies that we treat in the ICU, but it, it cannot be part of your strategy for the treatment of the lung uh, to put a patient on a vasopressor, make them intravascularly deplete, and force diuresis them. It just can't, right? The last thing is that people like to think that um, it's a vasopressor versus ionotrope situation, and it really isn't. And I, I use this slide a lot, where I have a um, basically a matrix with uh, dilators on one side, pressors on the other, negative ionotropes and positive ionotropes on either side, and uh, I plot everything on there uh, with my residents, and we sort of try and work it out. And as you can see, the vast majority of the most studied and most influential uh, vasoactive agents are a bit of both. They're vasopressors, and they're ionodilators, and they're ionopressors, and they are negative ionotropes, and they are everything else in between, right? So it really has to be um, thought of as, as not the first part of your classification system. Uh, I really hate it when we start having conversations about vasopressors and ionotropes and people split them up first and then they go through every individual agent. I think that that's another reason why uh, as white belts we're very, very confused uh, with these things. I think that it's more important to talk about the strategy and that's what I'm going to try and concentrate on today. Um, in terms of a blue belt level discussion, so for blue belts, my expectation is that you should know what your second line is once you're on slightly higher doses than you would like. And I'll explain what slightly higher doses means in a second. And then, how do you figure out what to treat? How do you figure out the type of shock? Which is its own dedicated talk, but it's there. And trying to figure out when vasopressors will have negative outcomes. So, in general, vasopressin, in general, will have a negative effect on your cardiac index but will raise your blood pressure by vasoconstricting you uh, peripherally. 
okay? Mainly in the splanchnic circulation, but all over. Vasopressin used on its own has been argued to be more efficacious than noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Synergistically, they have the best effect. The cutoff to use them synergistically in many institutions is a level fit of 30 or uh, 0.2 in different institutions, up to 0.5, depending on what dosing units you use. Your reality uh, is that your benefits from the vasopressin don't kick in until the patient is so vasoconstricted that you don't care about the splanchnic circulation. And one of the main concerns with vasopressin is the splanchnic circulation, the circulation to your gut. It's not just because I have a general surgery background. It's, it's the truth. The other concern that I have with vasopressin up to a certain dose in units per hour is that it will influence cardiac output negatively by causing cardiac issues and coronary perfusion problems. That's why I would say vasopressin is really good to be given synergistically with norepinephrine. That's my take on it. And that's what the literature supports, and that's also what the guidelines support right now in general. Dobutamine can be given synergistically and should be given in certain cases. These cases are typically the cases where you know that there's a primary cardiac problem and your heart rate is not a problem because dobutamine, as you can see and as we discussed, will have other effects all around the body and at a certain heart rate will actually produce extremely poor outcomes in terms of the cardiac index which is why milrinone which is a potent uh, ionodilator situation um, is probably another thing that you should have in your toolbox with milrinone you have some of a, a vasodilatory effect but you also have a significant improvement in, in uh, cardiac contractility. Um, and in terms of, you know, when to use what, you really should be doing ultrasounds. By and large, whether it's in the emergency room or in the ICU, the biggest change to my practice right now, and I think everybody else's is, that we can now use the ultrasound to give us all the information that we used to get from three or four different tools that was never as accurate. So, uh, you know, chest x-ray, uh, Swangans catheter, uh, art line, uh, Litco, uh, CVP has all been condensed now into one very viable, very well validated, very well studied, easy to use, non-invasive point of care tool. And so uh, right from the outset, this tool should be used. I don't care whether you use the rush, a high map approach, uh, fast, you want to call it fast ultrasound, go ahead and call it that, or just do an echo. But you should use this tool in general at blue belt level to dictate how you're going to approach a patient who's just on way too much stuff. All right. So uh, the second line discussion starts off with your first line vasopressor. And then you need to optimize your preload fluid balance and try and treat the underlying shock and decide what type of underlying shock you have and how it's affecting you. Is it a distributive problem? Then vasopressin is going to be your second line. Or if, if it's if yeah if it's a distributive problem or if it's a problem that might be hard to treat without vasopressin, the vasopressin is the second line. I'll explain what I mean by hard to treat in a second. If it's a cardiac function problem, right, and you have a high heart rate, I'd start the milrinone and have the vasopressin just in case you need it because milrinone will drop your blood pressure as it causes some dilation effect. Okay, if it's a low heart rate. Uh, I would add the dobutamine. Now, this is just an arbitrary approach that I teach within my practice uh, for my guys. Some of them, when they become attendings, hate all of it. Uh, I have a person who starts vasopressin first. Um, he's still a better intensivist than I am most days. But it's just something to think about in terms of a safe, structured, evidence-based approach. Now, the problems with vasopressors are that, number one, your your ability to manage your insulin and uh, glucose is very, 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 like steroid levels of very hard, okay? Number two, uh, you are causing some peripheral ischemia. There are still cases where I see uh, blue fingers and blue toes, 
uh, happening all around ICUs. Okay. Number three, you're going to have a long-term stress dose steroid problem. Number four, your immune response is going to take a hit. Your ability to produce an immune response is going to take a hit, especially with dopamine and with norepi. Um, you know, I just hate levosimendan, so we're not going to talk about it. Now, what about non-vasopressor shock state? So, what I'm trying to say here is, what if you have um, somebody who who does who needs a higher target uh, blood pressure, and you need to raise it artificially, and they're just they're, they're stable at that level forever. That question I'll talk about when we get to the end of the talk. But in general, keep that in mind that that with this situation here, with the effects of of of, of vasopressor use long term, you are going to have sort of a a shock state for a prolonged period of time, and there has to be some strategy there too. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. In terms of brown belts. At brown belt level, I would say, you know, be prepared for the oh shit moments. So oh shit moments are when you have no lines and when you have no time. Your no line situation, you can use an IO. Now an IO will never treat everything. An IO should be a temporizing measure. I like them in the emergency room. If I'm called to the ward for a peri code rapid response team situation, I'll start peripheral uh, epi, levofed, or phenylephrine. I don't really like phenylephrine that much. But I like to do this on a single dedicated line that I know is in. So I might try and do ultrasound guided in most cases. And I'll target something that could be turned into a uh, pick line in case I need it, etc. Like I make sure that it's a nice big line, big vein. Um, both are a bridge to a central line. You need to recognize that. Uh, I did an episode on venous access uh, a while back. I'll put a link in the show notes and um, if you want to reference it. When you have no time, your only solution is push dosing. So, uh, epinephrine or phenylephrine. I, my preference is for epinephrine because it's it, it just its time of onset seems to be better in my own eyes, even though the literature doesn't support that. It's completely non evidence based. And what I do is I do nine cc's of normal saline and one cc of epi, and then I draw up ten cc's and I give one cc aliquots uh, to get my desired response. With phenylephrine. I go slightly different, so uh, it's 100 cc's of NS and 1 cc of phenylephrine. Uh, and uh, each cc that you give is going to be 100 micrograms. Uh, I tend to give about a 1 to 2 cc aliquots up to 3 cc aliquots. Now, there are cases where I will give levonate. I just draw it up in the syringe, uh, about 4 cc's of it, and then I complete it up with another 6 cc's and I give 1 cc increments. And that comes from very, very limited, like three studies, okay? And my main reason for doing that is when I'm in a really uh, witnessed uh, ED thoracotomy situation, and I just want to give them a push while I'm opening the chest, like a nice like punch while I'm opening the chest. That's my main reasoning for using it. At black belt level, your concepts become the non-vasopressor shock states. Right, so refractory shock states, chronic shock states. And I'll be honest with you, ask me in 10 years. I really don't consider myself an expert in ICU yet. I consider myself an expert to an extent, but not a be-all, end-all, um, you know, uh, superhuman, uh, particularly uh, amazing, uh, never-before-seen legendary intensivist. I'm pretty good at other things. But in terms of the ICU, uh, I'm humble enough to say that I'm sure I missed some things with this talk. I'm sure that there'll be things that you disagree with and things that you will correct, including my typos. A bracket here, a full stop over there, you can go back and check. They're all there for all of you to witness. And I feel very much the same way at black belt level. That you're, you're, The key concept here is that as you become a black belt, not only are you learning on your own, but you're facing problems that may not be easily solvable and problems that may go against certain concepts that you thought were absolutely, forget it, concepts that had to be there. And that's why I keep saying, ask me in 10 years, because I think it, it's a longer journey than, expertise is a longer journey than most people assume. Um, you know, I, I hear people across 
uh, emergency rooms all over the world, whether it's in the States, France, Canada, South Africa. I've worked in a bunch of places. Um, wherever I go to visit, th there's usually a significant number of very humble, uh, very high-level experts, higher-level experts than I think I would ever be in my non-existent career. But in other places, I tend to see, um, you know, every now and then you'll see one person who really just feels that the word expertise um, denotes something more special than it really is, which is just an ability to recognize difficult situations and react to them accordingly. And I would say that refractory shock states, so refractory shock states are either you can't get them off of levofed forever uh, or norepinephrine, or that you can't get the stuff to work, basically, right? And either way, it's not good, right? So it's either a receptor problem or a catecholamine response problem. By and large, receptor problems are either because of an intractable acidemia, and, you know, catecholamine receptors tend to stop working at a pH of 7.15, and then they stop working completely at any pH above 7. And so you need some sort of buffer solution. And th the reality is that every buffer solution has its problems. Using a bicarb-based buffer solution, uh, people tell me that I'm producing too much CO2, which is, I think, a mythological response. Anybody who understands physiology, unless you have a dead space problem, you should be okay. Other buffer solutions, such as THAM and acetate, uh, were used in dialysis a lot. Uh, and the acetate-based solutions, I think, are off the market in many places now, uh, unless you're using them for dialysis. So uh, some caution there. THAM is definitely off the market, unless you're using it for uh, manufacturing purposes. Um, so I'm only left with bicarb. Uh, and uh, my cocktail for bicarb comes with single strength and double strength. So single strength bicarb is uh, three amps of bicarb with uh, a liter of uh, D5 free water. And my um, double strength is uh, three amps of bicarb and 500 cc's. It's literally double the strength. And I will uh, run it uh, as a bolus for fluid replacement purposes while supplementing the bicarb to temporarily correct the pH, and it's only temporary and it's not evidence-based. It's just what I've been taught by somebody else who taught somebody else, and I've seen it in more than one institution. It's not evidence-based. But it will give you a corrected pH so that your catecholamine receptors can continue to work until you gain control of the underlying cause of your shock, whether it's sepsis, whether it's toxicological, etc. Your other problem is glucose levels. So at very high or very low glucose levels, catecholamine receptors stop working, okay? And it takes a while for you to correct the glucose because it is quite treatment resistant in extreme intractable shocks. The third thing is a lot of the intractable shocks are, are toxicological shocks, and that would require a toxicological response. So you have to treat the underlying toxicological issue. I'm going to give a whole talk on toxicology, maybe even do a two-parter, which probably this should have been. Uh, looking back, and um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you should treat the underlying toxicological problem, and you can use things like a bicarb drip as a bridge still, but recognize that you will get some criticism from my learned colleagues and myself sometimes. Lastly, another very good thing is to try and use non-catecholamine agents, so things like vasopressin, uh, which acts on its own receptor, its analogs like uh, tilopressin, uh, seralopressin, all of these can be used with some efficacy when you have a receptor problem. When it's a catecholamine response problem for other reasons, like I said, vasopressin is a very good drug for it. Methylene blue is excellent in extremis and to get patients off of pump in certain situations when you're dealing with cardiac patients. Angiotensin II analogs, the jury's still out. I haven't used them personally. I can't comment on them, but I added them here just in case. Um, you know... Then you have the patient that's been on norepinephrine forever. You know, every ICU has one or two patients that's been chronically on them. And there are a couple tricks that you can do uh, to try and help to liberate them uh, from uh, their vasopressors. And one of the things that you can do is you can use midrodine. Uh, midrodine is a, a drug uh, that uh, effectively is a tablet form of a vasoactive agent. Okay, I'm not going to go vasopressor, ionotrope, etc. anymore. Let's call everything a vasoactive agent. 
And, you know, uh, you're going to ask me why we don't just give somebody a pill when they're hypotensive. The reason why is because it's difficult to titrate. Uh, it looks like a, a, a very clean dose response uh, curve there, but it's, it's not. It's, 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 it's much more difficult to titrate in our patient population. And so I, I, I've only used it once or twice for patients where um, I know that the perfusion problem is going to be persistent for a while. And I know that they're, they're in a stable state of instability, a forever shock state. And, um, you know, an example would be neurological conditions. So neurogenic shocks would benefit from midridine. Uh, certain types of chronic uh, cardiogenic shocks may benefit from midridine in certain types of intents and goals of therapy, right? So uh, watch this space. Um, uh, typically, the dose will vary between 10 and 20 milligrams. And uh, that's it for now. Uh, please let me know in the comments uh, what things I have forgotten or missed. And um, again, uh, I apologize if I missed stuff. And if you're not bored, please like, comment, and subscribe. This is Saud Al Zaid, and thank you for listening.